Okay. Well, um, thank you very much uh, for everybody coming here to this session. Uh, this is the session for, for the Dynamic Coalition uh, dedicated to robotics and healthcare. The, a little bit also about uh, digital health. Our main coordinator is online, Amali, and she will introduce herself. Amali, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Amado. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we are the Dynamic Coalition on Data-Driven Health Technologies uh, with the Internet Governance Forum. And what we have today is a topic of robotics and how it's integrating with the medical Internet of Things. Um, we have seen um, artificial intelligence flourish over the past decade or so. And robotics is basically artificial intelligence with now a physical format as well. So uh, there are many similarities uh, when we discuss the issues uh, going forth. And we have been discussing uh, this with the public as a coalition over the past year. This has been the focus of our study. And we've had a number of questions come out to us um, in terms of um, one, how do you reach remote locations? Can robotics and the Internet of Things um, support people in rural areas? For instance, how can they support uh, people with disabilities and other marginalized groups? So we, we are going to try to discuss these issues. We have a number of uh, distinguished speakers with us, and they will share their insights. And then after that, we will open uh, the discussion uh, to the public. Now I'm trying to share my screen. I hope this will work. Um, is this sharing? Let's see. Is that showing? Yes. It is, okay. So uh, as you can see, we have um, a lineup here of uh, Mr. Oscar Garcia, uh, Dr. Samuel uh, Grasic, um, unfortunately can't be here um, due to uh, something that emergency, uh, he actually just become a new father. So he can't join us, but he has sent us a YouTube. And then we have Judah Crow, he's with you in, in, the, uh, in the room. We have Judith, we have uh, uh, Professor Gupta as well, who's in with you in the room. So let's start with um, Oscar Garcia, please, who will, share with us a little bit about his work on medical records and going out of space and how that actually can be relevant to reaching rural populations. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and I ask uh, Oscar to please uh, take the floor. Hello everyone, can, can you hear me? Hello, yes, we can, thank you. Okay. I uh, appreciate very much this invitation uh, the, of the data collation about healthcare uh, that uh, we have been talking also extensively with Amalia and with other, other uh, persons uh, in this group. Um, this is uh, something that we, we have been working for, for 20 years more or less. Uh, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, We'll try to show you uh, a, a short presentation of our works in medical records uh, for, uh, for all these years and for our experience and uh, some lessons that we have learned uh, through all these years uh, working in this, uh, uh, in this technology. Let me see if uh, the sharing is working. Share screen. Not showing to me yet the option. Uh, tab. Let's see. Let me tell me if you can see yep. my presentation now. Hello? We, we can see it, Oscar. Thank you. Good. Okay, perfect. Fantastic. Well, um, 
this is the uh, uh, initial slide. So, uh, so uh, um, as I said, my name is Oscar Garcia. I am the chief of Guararchi uh, Unified Medical Records. I also founded the Digital Health Information Network. Uh, I am also the project leader of the um, project working group of the ISOC Interplanetary Chapter. And I've been working in digital health since 1985, when it was not called digital health yet, and I started Unified Medical Records in year 2000. Um, some uh, uh, topics here, well, we had a, a, an award from the World Summit of the Information Society for Argentina in 2005. The same year, Medline from the National Library of Medicine in the United States also received this award. And uh, as we have been in, in space uh, medical records, uh, we were nominated to the British Interplanetary Society, the Arthur C. Clarke, C. Clarke Award two years ago. We have been 23 years in, in medical records deployments. Uh, we, our system are around 60,000 patients and uh, more than a million of clinical tests and, well, uh, some numbers. Um, we have presented this technology in World Health Organization, World Summit of Information Society, NASA, several hospitals, uh, also in uh, sister cities in, in connections in different countries. Um, what kind of users we work we uh, work uh, with uh, health insurance of the uh, labor unions with the dialysis center that are uh, areas uh, very challenging uh, and difficult. Uh, <clears throat> we work uh, we have been working also in very challenged environments where there is no internet connectivity. And this is quite a point very important in, in, in the terms of digital health that I'm going to explain later, work with doctors, uh, uh, laboratory for tests, uh, RX systems, patients, okay. And <clears throat> we say like uh, uh, in a way that the need for me monitoring medical records in an integrated digital system has become essential in the healthcare systems. Um, the best method for diagnosis uh, and medical care that you all know, uh, because you are all experts in this area, uh, the extension of life expectancy, which uh, derives in the aging of population, the new technologies, uh, all require deep knowledge to interface all that, uh, all that things. And there have been multiple ventures uh, to try to solve this problem, but with diverse state. Uh, because most times they start from some concept that lack uh, deep knowledge of how the health systems work, not only in terms of technology terms, but in how, uh, how is the relationship between doctors, governments, insurances, and, and, uh, and all the different providers of healthcare that uh, uh, we have studied in deep these relationships to make things work, because otherwise it's only uh, an idea, fantastic idea, but a few organizations have had a successful experience in, in managing all this information and being able to operate in big cities where the internet connection is permanent or more or very stable and in rural communities where computer systems usually are, are not so stable and understanding the need, the needs of the different medical professionals, because every doctor has a different way of, of seeing uh, this thing. I'm going to explain more about that later. Um, let me see. Uh, I think my, my presentation jumped a bit. Uh, I'm going to, well, some uh, issues that I found uh, over the years are that each specialty doctor uh, from different specialty need a different view of the patient medical record. There are about 40 specialties and 87 specialties in different countries, this varies. Um, and every doctor would like to see the medical record to be shown in a different way and to upload different data. But each patient is unique and has different parameters. 
and also we have semantics, sem semiology, uh, sim sign and symptoms, and this means that uh, there's a lot of interpretation in, 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 uh, from the professional and how, uh, and to exchange this information uh, is uh, very difficult many times because of this different semantics, uh, a way of interpreting things. And the doctors need to take fast decisions and does not have much time to load information to a system. And this has to do also with the interface between the professional and the system. Um, there are also what I'll call uh, uh, the dictionaries. Uh, uh, you have, may have heard about the World Health Organization International Classification of Diseases, different version 9, 10, 11, uh, recently. There are modifications, for example, in the United States, uh, there are modifications in Europe, uh, and there are different uh, codings for procedures, for example, that a doctor uh, uh, makes. And uh, so what's the problem with this? If we need to compare the information between different countries or between different uh, pathologies or situations, uh, the problem is that we, we cannot match one thing with the other. And we have been working with this for many years. Also, medical records are disseminated and disconnected. And uh, there are several providers of information for the same patient. You all know that you go to a doctor, to a hospital, but then sometimes they say, go to a laboratory to make a test. Uh, and there are also paper and digital medical records and different technologies of electronic medical records, a West report. And most healthcare providers are not fully connected or partially connected. Also, the healthcare system in most countries uses a third payer model, which means that uh, the patient is not paying, but the health insurance is paying for the practice. And this requires also to interface between the uh, doctor's activity and the administration system. Many times, regulations in many countries make it easy for patients to access their own medical records. And you also need to have public statistics to take policy decisions. At the same time, uh, some years ago, in 1997, in the Jakarta, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Congress made by the World Health Organization, it has been uh, said, and it's trying to be, uh, that uh, is to empower the patient to be more aware or more connected with the medical decisions that are involved for him and for his family and his uh, uh, his uh, city, uh, and this needs also uh, knowledge and information for the patient to be more uh, empowered, and that's the right and correct one. And also, there's the concept of privacy, that medical records are private information, but need to be accessed for third persons, like the doctors or the administration, and there are different regulations in different countries that need to be complied. And this is a changing process all the time. That's what we have been, I, I described challenges. That was, we have been working interconnecting the healthcare system for many years. You see uh, a lot of uh, computers uh, networks there in the design. Our first deployment was in 2004, connecting healthcare providers, insurances, clinical laboratories, imaging diagnostic centers. All the pictures that you are going to see now are real. They are not pictures that are um, from uh, designers. And for a health system to work, you need to have all the parts and communicate between them and interface these parts between them. So you have to have a system for the doctor office, for the health insurance, apps for patients, uh, you can see some QR codes uh, refer to, uh, if you take a picture, they are going to refer you to some web pages. 
uh, we also developed recently this pen drive that allows doctors in challenge environments where there are no connectivity to go from one computer to the other in different places. And uh, we have made, uh, developed this in English, French, Spanish to bring it anywhere with no installation to connect and receive clinical tests to transmit information. But if you have no communication, it connects and works and something that we have been asked a bit this can also connect, for example, with devices, robots. You have uh, a link there, and you can also upload a form And if you want to be part of our development of this. Uh, during the pandemic, we discovered uh, the need for app for patient, telemedicine, uh, remote auditing, uh, a health dashboard uh, to administer it remotely the system, because people, uh, and even doctors, could not go to the places many times. Well, we have here a, a long list of technologies and outcomes, but uh, more important, and uh, I'm going to show you something later about DTN technologies, interchanges model of information, many things that we have developed, and outcomes that are better healthcare, more simple interfaces for doctors, uh, cost reduction with uh, keeping a, a very good, a very high level of care, um, and uh, to analyze uh, pathologies and outcomes and results of, of, uh, of the treatments. Uh, and our next step is something that uh, we have been uh, asked as well is to, uh, uh, we started to work in medical record for exploration. Uh, we want to make consultations between space and earth. We are, uh, we presented this in 2020 uh, in several expositions and, and um, we also have uh, uh, shown this to NASA and other space agencies. <clears throat> what are the applications? Well, of course, research tourism in space, and of course, living in space and other planets, that's something that uh, uh, humanity is thinking at this time. Uh, we are going to make this testing. Uh, we plan uh, to start off next year. This is the, um, the model of, of, of uh, the spacecraft. The, this is a plan for the moon. You have a, a web uh, there, and well, we, these are problems that we have been uh, researching the last times related to, to uh, difficulties uh, that will happen in space. And well, we want to keep this collaboration with the dynamic coalition on data-driven technologies. Well, we like to work in underserved communities and provide the services for free when it's possible, contact us. And to contact, you have there uh, our webpage and Afterwards, uh, we are going to have a, a query and uh, answers uh, session. So thank you very much for your time uh, and for this long presentation. Thank you very much, Oscar. Um, we really appreciate hearing about all of that. Um, and uh, I know you're working with uh, Dr. Versig closely um, in your, the development of your work. And uh, he's not able to be with us, as we know. Um, would you be able to play the YouTube that he has sent us, or? Yes. Uh, can you oh, give me? Can you give me one or two minutes that I, I look for yes. the right link? Yeah. Uh, well, well, you keep uh, uh, exchanging, yes. and, and and I will be glad to show you. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, you know, we, we are really interested in this uh, medical internet of things uh, because we're finding more and more, at least in Western countries, uh, for sure now, that patients spend very little time in hospital. So they will have an operation and they're sent home very quickly soon after. The monitoring then takes place by digital means, actually by email, uh, by internet connectivity of various monitoring devices to them in their bed. And as a result, um, of course, they are able to attend to way more people going through the hospital system. 
Um, but also the patient is now in a position where they have to have very good internet access to make sure all these devices are working very well for them. Most recently, for instance, in Europe, when there was the power shortage last year, uh, you know, there were tremendous cries for help from patients asking to have reliable internet connections um, to support the devices that were supporting their, let's call it bodily functions as well. So the internet is becoming very, very important. These medical devices might, the little robots, now bigger robots might have been developed independently, but are now increasingly being connected to the internet. And now of course we're getting much larger robots uh, for instance, China with uh, a very large population, we hear about 300 million people over the age of 60, is now looking to see how to take care of these elderly populations. And uh, they, are, they have starting to roll out nurse robots this year uh, to su uh, support nursing staff. Uh, now we know Japan, for instance, for decades has been developing um, robots for helping elderly people, whether it's do their cleaning, whether it's do their delivery, bring their food to them, or for instance, climbing stairs. And um, you know, Japan has been a tremendous powerhouse of, of development of this robotic activity. But now as we see, artificial intelligence is becoming ubiquitous and um, you know, the robots can use chat GPT and, and so forth. So it's now becoming, you know, an ecosystem where the robot perhaps was independent is now increasingly um, connected to the internet. And obviously, when it comes to healthcare, SDG number three, health and well-being for everyone, um, we, you know, we want to give that opportunity to everybody on the planet um, to be able to access the sophisticated healthcare and the advanced healthcare. Okay, uh, Oscar. <laughs> Ma, Ma, Amalie, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Facundo, that is uh, another of our collaborators, is going to uh, share his screen with some of presentation. Okay. Uh, related to what you have just said, there is yes. an important thing that uh, I mentioned in my presentation, and some of uh, Dr. Samograsi uh, has, uh, because the, the, as you said, uh, internet has been has turned into a very important thing for healthcare. But many times the availability is not so good because uh, that's not the problem of the of the of the internet, but of the connectivity. That are different things, uh, and uh, we have been working with DTN, the delay and um, a disruption tolerant networking, to work uh, with different uh, flavors, and and some of us been working on this to resolve this kind of situation. I, I would appreciate uh, if Facundo can share his screen. Um, Amado, I think he is on site. Yeah. Am I right in the room? Uh, oh, he's, uh, yes, he's yes. online. He's online. He's online? Oh, he's online. Okay. Uh, Facundo, but no. he, he's not, I, I'm not sure he's online. Uh, yes. do, do you have another user online? Do, do you have another user? No. Uh, I. I'm not sure he is online, Amali. If you wish, we can continue with speakers here locally. Uh, uh, he says me in the chat that he's online, Amado. Ah, okay. If he is, um, can he? But uh, he's not allowed to share screen. Uh, it, it could be some some. Uh... Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank okay. you. Bye. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We have I no sound. We have, we have no sound. Well, I'm going to I'm going to explain this myself if that's okay. Um, uh, this is a platform for uh, uh, that we. Uh, that uh, uh, some have been working for many years in the um, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, he lives in Sweden, and uh, the concept is uh, that uh, the uh, communication is uh, very very difficult um, in that situation. You have seen the ice. Well, Samuel from Lulia 
University of Technology, he's the developer at that body's uh, Economical Association, and uh, he's also a member of the Interplanetary Network and Special Interest Group, with, where we work together, and this, uh, he is CEO at uh, the Labs. The challenges of internet in space can be applied also for these, uh, uh, these uh, difficult situations. Uh, uh, if you can see the, the lines between uh, Earth and space are, uh, are not uh, um, a continuous lines because uh, I, uh, I can start my camera as requested. Um, there are no continuous lines because the uh, communication between uh, um, Earth and space uh, is uh, uh, disrupted, what we call disrupted. But uh, uh, here, hmm? uh, the, the, you can see the radio, radio link disruptions uh, and, uh, and <coughs> uh, as uh, distance increases, the um, is more, uh, the, the, this disruption increases, for example, if we go to Mars, there are 21 minutes uh, come and forth between the information between uh, the, the different points, endpoints that we call. <clears throat> the concept is uh, what is called a store and forward, meaning the information arrives to a certain point and then when the connectivity is available again, the uh, information jumps to uh, another another um, uh, a step of this network. Uh, this is in a standard uh, that is, has been developed for, for many years. We have been working with uh, uh, persons like, uh, uh, this is, was an idea for a group that started in GPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA, uh, uh, impulsed by, by Pink Surf, and, and that uh, is the, also the uh, creator of the TCPIP protocol <clears throat> and allows that it can run over different communication te technologies. Uh, already uh, has been adopted by NASA, by JAXA, that is the Japanese uh, uh, Aerospace uh, uh, Organization, ESA, that is the European Organization for the Space, and what we have been working for uh, some, some time, about three years, is uh, to apply this technology to Earth uh, for this kind of situation. Some of, uh, Dr. Grasic has been with his group working um, in this project for more than 10 years, that uh, this was uh, initiated, uh, uh, what is, Dalbadis uh, is a, a, a an organization in Sweden that works with the Sami community very far north in the in the ISIS and uh, they they keep reindeers herds and these reindeers as, as, as you can imagine uh, all, all around in the Arctic uh, grazing and, and come and go so what the Samo has developed is technology using this DTN technology that with uh, very, um, in very difficult situations and challenging, uh, there were, there's no infrastructure in terms of antennas, uh, they um, track the, the deers all around um, and with technologies that are very, uh, very uh, not expensive at all. And uh, this was part of this project that was very important because what happens is that, for example, satellites, sat satellite technologies uh, are now are getting more affordable, you know, because uh, there are uh, companies that are um, launching uh, these uh, tracks of, of satellites, uh, and not to mention the, the commercial names, uh, but um, this was very expensive. We have used satellites years ago and was very expensive to, to keep this. And, and what Dr. Grasic, uh, Samo Grasic has developed is a technology that's 
very, very, uh, very, uh, uh, you, uh, you can work with this with not much money at all. Uh, you have there some of the uh, specifications. Uh, I'm not a real expert in his development, but I've been following this for about three years, so uh, I can explain a bit. Um, the, uh, the, uh, one of the concepts is to use uh, solar and battery powered with very low power consumption uh, and, and set up, uh, for example, you can see there those are antennas um, and um, well, using a technology that is called LoRa, that's low range radio system. This radio system uh, has the capability of working with the small messages and these small messages uh, allow uh, to send like SMS messages and they develop also mobile, mobile apps. So the herders of the reindeers can uh, follow where the herds are all around with just a mobile phone. Huh? Uh, well, they develop this, uh, uh, this antenna. Uh, I've seen, uh, perhaps there is some picture of this. I've seen this cover with eyes. Uh, they can stand very, very challenging situations. And each antenna can connect with, uh, it builds a network with, uh, with the different, uh, with the different um, connections. Uh, so uh, with the information for the different herds, the, the Sami population that uh, lives there can keep track. Um, and we have been working also, I'm talking with some, um, uh, some time ago, of using all this same kind of technology to apply to uh, technologies like medical records or healthcare information to uh, keep when people are in the Arctic in situations very, very difficult and very complicated, uh, they can uh, request connection. Uh, here is uh, um, this uh, uh, trail that they, um, that they, uh, connect, uh, they, they take the antennas to the Arctic, uh, some of those often, uh, and this is a, a, a collar <laughs> that they use in the, the reindeer that was developed by Samo and, and his group. Uh, um, it, uh, you can see that the battery life is two and a half year, uh, and it was printed with a, a, a 3D printer and uh, has an internal antenna. So the, uh, with this, they, they identify, identify, um, uh, uh, identify each of the, of the reindeer. <clears throat> well, uh, these are different, different developments uh, that are um, used, uh, that are, have been developed by his group. This is a note that can be uh, attached to a drone. And uh, I know uh, that they have been working also. Uh, here you have um, how, how it is applied. They have been working also in a buoy to go uh, under uh, underwater. And this is the application that runs on the on their, um, uh, mobile and the cell phones. And, uh, and this is, keep, you see the map and the different messages that are received from the network, the DTM network that uh, uh, Samo has developed uh, there. Uh, the idea with this is uh, uh, the concept of uh, developing application to, uh, um, uh, to work with uh, what you have mentioned, uh, uh, Amali, that is, uh, the concept that, and, and I mentioned that before as well, uh, that centralized databases uh, many times are not the solution for this kind of situation. Distributed databases make this kind of service more resi resilient, more resistant, and this can help uh, to resolve situations like the one you, um, uh, you mentioned. 
uh, well, uh, and you have there the, the email address of Samo at Jurassic Net, and uh, he, he'll be happy to uh, respond uh, uh, what I cannot respond and try to, to help as much as I can. Thank you. Oscar, that, that was very, very helpful. Thank you so much for, for your help with that. Um, Oscar and Samo work very closely together, so we are very thankful for this opportunity that Oscar can uh, explain the slides that uh, the audio was not able to share with us. But what we will do is we will post this uh, presentation from Samo uh, onto the uh, IGF uh, DC, our own uh, Dynamic Coalition webpage, so that um, anyone can access that uh, in Samo's words as well um, uh, into the future. So um, I am I'm very pleased with 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 this uh, you know this sharing of this information because I I know for instance in a lot of countries we are increasingly getting nervous let's say about climate change we are hearing of floods uh, we are hearing earthquakes. Uh, fires, um, and sometimes in, in very remote areas. And then how, you know, are these people to be served? Um, and, uh, you know, these are solutions that probably can be put in place very quickly to serve uh, some of these people in distress. So, uh, you know, uh, disaster relief was something that this dynamic coalition was really very interested in over uh, several years. So this is another area that uh, the work of Oscar and uh, Samo um, are appreciated for. Thank you so much. Okay, so now um, I am going to um, ask our own um, uh, dynamic coalition um, at IGF to please share some thoughts with us. And they are, you can see them um, on the panel there. And um, I would really appreciate if you could share with us some thoughts that you might have. Um, I know uh, some of you were, were requested to join us, um, you know, with very short notice. So I appreciate uh, you helping this dynamic coalition out. And uh, I know all of you have been uh, studying and researching artificial intelligence. And I think sharing some of those uh, thoughts with us in terms of what you're experiencing with uh, artificial intelligence in your own areas, would I think be very helpful for us working with robots because robots are powered by artificial intelligence. So I'm going to take this opportunity to ask Judah Kroll if she could introduce herself and to please give us some insights um, as they come flow for her. Please. Okay, I, I think it's working. Uh, I'm already, I've already been introduced by Amali, so I, I only would say a few words about my position. I'm coming from a German NGO called Digital Opportunities Foundation, which is dealing since more than 20 years now from on the developments that digitization brings to society and what impact uh, digitization will have on society. Um, I would like to go in my statement a big back to 1989 when the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child was adopted. And uh, the UN Convention states in Article 24 that uh, state parties sh should recognize the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health and to facilities for the treatment of illness and rehabi rehabilitation of health. So it's laid down there more than, than 30 years ago uh, and obviously, no one could uh, imagine what role digitization would play in health, not only for children, but as it's laid down in, in the UN Convention. Um, and what we've already heard about medical statistics and data that can be used for the health for everybody, uh, in uh, regardless of their age, but still uh, for the rights of the children are laid down in the UN Convention. And so in uh, the year 2019 20 to 2021, uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, was considering how could we adapt what we've laid down 30 years ago 
on the health uh, for children to this new environment that children are growing up now and how could we also try to describe how health technologies could be used for, for the health of children. And then uh, in March 2021, uh, a so-called general comment on children's rights in relation to the digital environment was uh, adopted by the committee, which I have some brought some copies and I will spread them around. And there, I, I just want to quote from one of the articles of this um, general comment, which is kind of an interpretation how to better understand what the rights that were laid down uh, in 1989 mean now that we live in a digital environment. And uh, in this general comment, uh, there is much attention given to birth registration and the right to identity of children. And that is the one point that I would like to pick up because health of children, of course, starts with with the beginning, so that means uh, at the time of their birth. And uh, we, we have heard from Amali and also from Oscar uh, about rural areas where probably we are not in the same situation like in a city like Kyoto, where of course children mostly are born in hospitals and then their, their birth certificate is, uh, is laid down and they, have they get health treatment from the beginning that is different in rural areas, and therefore it's important to consider what what digital um, what digitization can mean for children born in in, in rural areas, uh, how their right to birth registration and right to identity can be laid down there, and how uh, like that unified service uh, for data uh, for medical data can also be used to register children from the beginning and give them their identity and also then afterwards give the medical system and also the people themselves, the parents as well as other caregivers access to these data to treat the children like from the beginning and throughout their whole development. There are many other things in the general comment number 25 on children uh, in relation to the digital environment. And of course, the committee also uh, took notice that digitization has probably also risks for children's healthy growing up, like over extensive usage of digital media, for example. That's all addressed, but in, in this session, I would only like to refer to the benefits that digitization and medical treatment based on, on digital, uh, digitally processed data can bring uh, to the health of children. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Duta, for that uh, very, very important uh, identification of those issues. Um, just want to say that we'll take all questions at the end once all the speakers have uh, gone through their spaces. Um, I just want to add a little bit to, to Duta, you know, what she's talked about birth records and so forth. And something that has uh, been made aware to me is also um, indigenous populations and their um, languages and scripts. And, um, and I have heard sometimes that uh, identities have got lost. And, uh, you know, all of this comes together. I'm so glad, Juta, you mentioned this, because that has sometimes been the case where, um, you know, good translations um, and documentation have also meant to uh, losing children, as it were. So thank you so much, uh, Juta, for that. Thank you very much. Um, I would now like to ask uh, Dr. Gita if he would share some insights with us, please, and introduce himself. Thank you, Amali. Uh, I am Rajendra Gupta. I chair the Dynamic Coalition on Digital Health. And I also chair the uh, Commonwealth AI Consortium for Capacity Building across Commonwealth. Uh, first thing I would like to say to demonstrate the difference between robot and human being is, as you can see me, I am like almost sleepy. I woke up at 2 a.m. Robots don't do that. You know, so, uh, and this is what a few years back when I was in the same country, I saw a robot and I asked them that, why would you need robots in a hospital? He said, they don't chat when they go in the aisle so they can just work. And we don't ask for wage increment. But jokes apart, last month we hosted the Global Digital Health Summit in Mumbai. If you look up globalsummit.health. And 
what we demonstrated was very interesting. Like we have a panel here. One of the panelists was a robot. And this was indicative of the things to come in future. I mean, you can look up the video, the robot answers the questions that he was thrown. And the questions were thrown by the global strategy ahead of Google, Bakul Patel. So I think robots are for real and they will invade medical field for various reasons. And uh, last couple of weeks, I've been working with one of the architects of Da Vinci, uh, you know, trying to make the future leaders aware of what robotics can do. So there are two, two major roles that I see for robots in healthcare. One is they will replace routine tasks. Routine tasks is like carrying blood samples, taking medicines, transporting patients, and uh, routine stuff. I mean, this is just like you don't require a human intervention. And the second is most important, which is medicine. So let's accept that, that Robotic capability exceeds human capability. That's the first fundamental truth. So that is where, when you look at routine, what it'll do is cost savings and probably you know, bring in some efficiencies on the floor. But where the medicine part comes in is very interesting. And this I have been having discussions because of not only the summit, but also the course we run on digital health. We have been talking to actual leaders who actually were involved in robotics and the development of robotics as a field. So I think the biggest thing would happen is that uh, surgeries would be precise. And that is what I have spoken with a hospital that implemented robot. I said, why did you implement what's, what's the outcome? He said, clinical outcomes, less blood, blood loss, patients are happy, better healing. So there is a proven uh, benefit of robots on the clinical side. And on the on the uh, when you look at the functionalities they can take on too. So like you have a physiotherapist today a robot can do that better. A robot can be an exoskeleton for a person who has met with an accident and you know needs the artificial limbs. Transplants, today they are doing almost all the surgeries. I think one of the biggest things that you will see, and I think a aging nation like Japan is a very good example, and I think all nations will eventually reach that stage is the social interactions, you know, doing that uh, for seniors. And uh, other than that, like in COVID, we saw, you know, some of the hospitals started using for interaction with patients to avoid the spread of the infection, including, you know, the uh, sanitizing of the rooms, um, serving the patients. So robots are getting there. My worry is that this is not democratization of robotics. It's very high end. So a robot that I spoke to in a hospital, like, you know, with their deployment, it was two and a half million dollars. So expecting that robots will be like used, like everywhere in every hospital, that's not going to happen very soon. Yes, we are far, far away. Have they been able to demonstrate their ability? Of course, yes. They can do much better job than doctors in precision operations. You know, invasive surgeries, they can do what a hand can't do, what a doctor's eye can't do. So this is clearly there. But what I envision in future, and this is what I have been talking with the man who work behind the architect of uh, Da Vinci, is that eventually I would see robots like a cardiology robot, urology robot, gastroenterology robot. So I see a specialization of robotics happening over future. And I think we will hear, I think in the next few months, another company launching a miniaturized version of robot. Da Vinci is like a huge setup. When that happens, I probably feel that cost may come down a bit, but will it be democratized? Absolutely not. So well as a part of medicine, most of the high-end hospitals uh, may be in specialized you know, departments or maybe big hospitals, private hospitals, they may use robotics, but will public facilities use it? Very clear, no. I mean, they will still prefer surgeons who would do a job at a much cheaper rate because the initial investments is very high, the cost of maintenance is high, and if the technology changes, what do you do? So it is still to go a long way. But there was another question, I think, that we were talking about the remote surgery. So there is ample of evidence to show that uh, hundreds of miles away, you can actually mimic a surgeon's movement and do a surgery. Uh, I was in Poland uh, early this year and actually tried my hand from that robot. Actually, for me, it was not easy because I'm not a surgeon. Uh, you know, I tried to, but it's like if you train people, you can end up doing remote surgeries. But it will mean like we are still years away 
unless the cost comes down and you know we have enough trainers to train doctors but as a field i think it's developing pretty fast so i see a future when there will be specialized robots but we're still on the clinical side we are far off but on the routine side i think we will have a faster adoption so between clinical and routine routine will take off fast clinical is still years away thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. You've just introduced us to uh, just the whole spectrum of where robots uh, can be working. And uh, thank you very much for that uh, sharing with us. Um, I just want to add that ITU, uh, the AI uh, group there, is actually working very extensively and uh, recently put out a number of uh, procedures, I would say, and processes for AI uh, working with medicine. And um, I think uh, they are a group that's quite actively pursuing robots as well. So um, I think you know we're hoping that uh, into the future there will some be some uh, one obviously from our side, our dynamic coalition comes from the perspective of the patient and how the patient is going to interact um, with the robots and artificial intelligence in, in medicine. Um, so I, I think it's you know they're thinking of. Uh, bringing in standards, they're already working on that. And I think that would be very helpful for the patient side because we are going to approach these technologies coming to us and being used on us. And I think all of us would want to know a little bit beforehand what it's about, what are the risks, what are the potential harms, and so forth. And depending on, I would say, the sophistication um, of the patient, uh, you know, they would be. Uh, you know, more forthcoming or not uh, to these kinds of uh, uh, medical interventions. So this is the, our dynamic coalition is, is very focused on the patient perspective, uh, sharing from a multi-stakeholder perspective on what the patient can expect for the future. And in this case, why our discussion uh, this year is, is there something that the patient should share with the multi-stakeholder group that we are concerned and worried about? Uh, before it gets put into uh, the actual development um, of devices and systems. Because we are saying, okay, the design process, just like, you know, privacy from Bada and Amalfa and so forth, the design process is, is actually very important. So um, going to this, privacy is of, of concern to, uh, to all of us as patients going in, um, even just for a regular pay, uh, checkup, you know, we're perfectly healthy, we're still patients. So I'm going to hand uh, now uh, to our own coalition members, and thank you so much for our panel, um, to share on privacy and security. And I'd uh, like uh, uh, Yon uh, Upgut and Huda Chihi to please take the floor, please. Hello, everyone. Could you hear me, please? Yes, we can, Huda. OK, thank you so much. So uh, thank you so, uh, so much, Emily, and all uh, this is Sihash. Uh, coalition staff for inviting me. In fact, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Huda Shehi. I am PhD in telecommunication, senior research at Unofcom Laboratory of Sudcom, Tunisia. My main job is uh, chief engineering at Tunisia Telecom Operator. Okay, in fact, uh, today I will share uh, some uh, my insights about uh, the cyber, the necessity of cybersecurity into robots. In fact, uh, the idea of robots, which is based in cyber physical system, uh, it's very important nowadays in our life, which is we use it in many sector, sectors, uh, such as education, uh, healthcare, and agriculture. But at the same time, uh, it can be uh, just a second to uh, could you could you see me could you just it's, it's blurred now we can oh, see yeah. part sorry, of sorry. Yeah. so sorry yeah. now yes, i am visible good. yes okay. thank you Okay, thank you so much, my pleasure. In fact, uh, as robots are based in cyber physical process, we, have, we find it physical process and we find software ones. So here we speak about advantages 
and the effects of or ban and ban of the use of robots. In particular, the use of robots is very we when uh, towards healthcare we may we must take a, a, a great attention because it can be uh, very important because uh, advances for uh, for in, in particular for uh, towards the, the 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 problem of COVID nineteen for example it helps uh, doctors to reach uh, some patients or uh, uh, the case of uh, complicated uh, searches. Uh, it will be very important to use robots. But in the same way, if we don't take care of the cyber security, it will be, it will be very challenging. In fact, for this, it, uh, because it, uh, the cost will be the human life of our passion. So this is not uh, the good idea in this case. For this, we, there is uh, some steps or pillars of cyber security that uh, all of us, we should respect. We should uh, respect laws, cybersecurity laws toward the use of robots in healthcare is very important. And the second, we should raise awareness and trainings uh, to doctors and all uh, healthcare staff. For example, uh, for authorization is not uh, is not uh, it, it should uh, respect uh, a specific process of authentication process. Uh, we can use multiple uh, authentication process. So, uh, for example, uh, doctors uh, don't be advised to open platforms, a patient platforms in open Wi-Fi process or public Wi-Fi. It should be very secure and use specific and complicated password and should be uh, always updated. Uh, in addition, uh, the software should be always updated and patched following the recent uh, process and uh, in particular, uh, in addition, uh, as robots are based in artificial intelligence algorithm, it should be resistant to th threats and we should include uh, intru uh, and, uh, intrusion detection process into robots and should do some tests before that we uh, put them into uh, in the process of application uh, it, uh, some tests uh, of threats detection. If it is good, the tests uh, and the incident are well received and well done. So this robot will be dedicated and could be uh, applied for healthcare. Uh, if the process or tested at file, so we should review the artificial intelligence algorithm process. In addition, as the, uh, today we, sp uh, we speak a lot uh, emerg uh, about emerging technology, so our robots is uh, uh, normal that will be uh, connected to clouds because here we have a lot of sensors, medical internet of things, so uh, that uh, we have a lot of sensors, uh, camera, leaders, so we need a lot of information to collect from patient and from many sources, so there is a huge uh, occurrence of uh, security problems here. So, so we should uh, encrypt the communication, the data communication between the robot and the cloud. And uh, in general, the communication between robots and uh, each end, uh, whether it is doctors, uh, any plat or any digital platform should be encrypted to save the data and to ensure a, a, a safe communication and to protect the life of the uh, human uh, human beings or patient and uh, to ensure that this robot is used for uh, the benefit of uh, both sides, doctors or patients. In addition, here we speak about virtual platforms uh, due to use of ChatGPT. So uh, ChatGPT use should uh, be used and respect specific uh, cybersecurity rules and laws. It can't be used by any doctors without respecting specific cybersecurity norms. Uh, otherwise, it can be uh, in the benefit of anyone, either it is patient or uh, doctors. In addition, 
we should uh, a collaboration between IT team who is responsible of building uh, the artificial intelligence and uh, the collaboration between the different stockholders. Even it is uh, because here we have different actors who intervene between the communication of the, of the robots and the, the patient or the doctors. Here, a global collaboration between many stockholders should be uh, done uh, whether it is operator, because here we have uh, the communication is uh, always enabled by uh, the, for better communication and uh, connectivity. We find 4G, 5G, 6G, or, or other technology. So here is important to have a global uh, conversation between different actors, whether it is operator, uh, service providers, uh, actor, doctors, uh, government, uh, uh, and policy maker, decision makers to state specific uh, rules and laws. And uh, to either, it's also the responsibility of the IT team to uh, raise awareness and uh, organize free webinars, free training session for doctors to teach them how to use digital platforms in security ways and to always uh, build or update their passwords in, and, and uh, to ensure uh, uh, complicated uh, passwords that in the way that the access will be done only or will be uh, the access is only uh, dedicated for uh, the, uh, the health staff and uh, there is no uh, possibility of intrusion or uh, threats. Here also a process of updating the all the all software end to end and the cloud the cloud to uh, security tools to uh, security to secure the cloud the cloud process and here we speak about uh, overall uh, uh, cryptography process of the end to end communication whether from the passion to the cloud this is uh, my intervention thank you so much thank you very much for that um very, very much appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to Johan now. Yeah? Johan, um, please introduce yourself. And Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I uh, uh, can share a slide if you want. <clears throat> I'm um, affiliated with the University of Geneva, and I will keep it short. <clears throat> Let me see. Um, so um, <clears throat> robots and data protection, I would fo uh, like to focus on data protection while uh, Huda uh, tried to focus on, on IT security. Um, and <clears throat> robots have many sensors. They <clears throat> can see, they can um, <clears throat> listen, they can feel the temperature, they have access to ex uh, external sensors. And suppose you would have a surveillance system in your hospital room that does all that, you would not feel comfortable. But as a robot, <clears throat> people tend to be more comfortable because it looks like a human, but actually it's, it's a spying <clears throat> tool. Of course, this spying <clears throat> is at least first for your good. It helps to, to watch you to, uh, to, if you need something to give you the proper med uh, <clears throat> care, <clears throat> but so uh, how will this data be processed? First, is the data being stored? A robot <clears throat> needs vision to move around, but do they need to record everything? And if it is stored, how long will it be stored? <clears throat> and what is it used for? I mean, of course, it will be used for your medical treatment, but it could also be used to <clears throat> analyze the robot. Where uh, is the um, robot performing well and where does it fail? It could be used to monitor humans, uh, the human <clears throat> staff in the hospital, whether they perform their task well or not. It could be used to record how uh, visitors behave, or if it's used at your home, how other people in your household behave. <clears throat> and who has access to that data? Just the doctor, the whole hospital staff, or maybe even the manufacturer, because they say, well, 
of course, we need that data to improve the robot. And actually, this is not wrong. But do you want your data, your images lying in the hospital being accessible by some manufacturer? <clears throat> of course, we say, well, you need consent. Has the patient consented? Yes, of course, you do consent. But is the consent informed and voluntary? <clears throat> I mean, of course, you can um, get a, um, a piece of paper with uh, everything listed on it. But to be voluntary, it has <clears throat> to be um, granular. That means that you um, need to have the choice to reject all uses of uh, your data that are not really necessary for your treatment. <clears throat> and um, can relatives, uh, uh, for example, access uh, this and these records? For example, somebody dies in the hospital, can they access the records to sue the hospital? Well, do uh, doctors have to consent to that? Or is it a, a right of um, the patients or the uh, relatives that they get access to this data? Can law enforcement uh, access it? So there are many questions, uh, many open questions, and it's, it's not an easy part. And <clears throat> like IT security, there are many standards that need to be applied and not just a list of things and like like uh, complicated passwords it's it's much more complicated <clears throat> and data protection is also quite um sophisticated uh, thing because uh, in the hospital you have uh, very sensitive data <clears throat> it's um, one of the most sensitive data and uh, you are processing large amounts of this data much more than before and uh, this will require very proper governance Thank you. Thank you, Jorn. So thank you, Jorn and Huda, for that uh, very insightful, uh, uh, I guess, uh, nuance to, to medical records, as it were, um, and Amali, information gathering. Would yes. you allow that no. I comment only a few words sure, to, sure, to Jan? Sure. I'm so glad sure. to be on a, on a panel <laughs> also virtually with Jan, uh, because we've okay. been uh, in contact. Uh, but what he's saying and what he's showing on his slide reminds me that we had a session on Internet of Things and Children some time ago at the Internet Governance Forum where we were discussing Teddy the Guardian and that was like a, a robot looking like a cozy teddy bear for children. You could put that in the bed of the child and the teddy would uh, measure all the data that we've been talking about. How is uh, the, the ox oxygen in the blood of the, of the child? Uh, how is the body temperature of the child? How is their rapid eye movement? So everything that you would like to know about uh, the child could be measured and monitored by, by the teddy that you just put into the bed of the child. And the, of course, a child feels cozy with having such a plus a bear in their bed. And the parents could monitor that wherever that would be. They could monitor it on their smartphone, the same medical data that could go to the parents, could go to the pediatrics of the child. So we have the same situation there that you can monitor everything, but we need to answer the question, where does the data go? Is there probably a risk of interception of the data when it goes from the teddy bear to the smartphone of the parents or to the hospital uh, or to the, the doctor? And I, I do think these questions are not yet answered. Totally agree with that. You know? <laughs> totally agree with that. Um, in, in interest of time, um, I think uh, Judith uh, may respond to one of the questions we had online on accessibility. Well, sure. But uh, uh, Ms. Judith Halsey, representing the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. But first, I do want to respond to Yuta. Yes, we had those, but the, a lot of those teddy bears are viewed to be very insecure because they are, the, at that time, the Internet of Things was not secure. There was old data on theirs. There was problem of being hacked, 
and the child data could be stolen or the child could be told to give out different things. That was a very, there was no rights and pr protections on that data, especially for data for children. But I also wanted to respond to the couple of things with the robot when you were talking about the other dynamic coalition is that, that there's a really grave danger for persons with disability for using robots where they cannot communicate to persons who, who may be visually uh, impaired or hearing impaired or even cognitively impaired and how would a robot respond to that and they can't and so these people are now being disenfranchised and they cannot do it in the hospitals especially during the period of COVID when they said oh we'll, we'll do video conferences but they didn't have uh, people could not see the uh, person through the masks. There was no vid, there was no white, there was no clear mask. You couldn't read people's lips. You couldn't have a visual sign language. You couldn't have any of that. And so it was uh, as if um, persons with disability were, were not allowed to get sick because no one would care for them. And so there's a grave danger when you have robots doing that is that you're now disenfranchising a huge part of the population who cannot get that. And so instead, uh, where I used to have uh, the telephone relay where they would call up and sell a picture and there would be a sign language interpreter or there'll be another interpreter, these type of things won't be existing. And that's the grave danger with the robots in that se section. Um, and I think the, the, the question on accessibility I guess, let me just look again in the chat, um, is that, like as he said, if the AI is being used in a surgical robot, um, the, if the misidentification can result in the AI providing bad surgical guidance, which can lead to surgical errors, and especially as people are starting to use, um, instead of human captioning, they're using artificial intelligence captioning, which often is, could be really bad and does not tell you what the person is saying. Um, and there's a reliance on that. They think, oh, it's great. I don't have to pay for human captioning, but then people are losing out. They're not being clear. The guidance is not being clear, and it's a huge danger of that. So we have to make sure that persons with disabilities are taken that care of and that you don't lose out, disenfranchise a whole lot of population in the, in the effort to make things cheaper. And I know in, in the interest of time, so I'll just stop there, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Judith. We have, um, thank you very much for that, to, to bring accessibility. I'm, I'm so happy that you uh, responded there for us. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I just have to make a couple of announcements, uh, which I promised to do. Um, and uh, it's we, that we have a book called Health Matters, and it's published online um, on the DC uh, DDHT uh, webpage uh, at the Internet Governance Forum. And each year we add articles to this book. And we have three writers uh, of articles in 2023, Frederick Cohen, Dr. Uh, Joao Gomez, and Yao Amevi uh, Amesi Susu. So I just want to highlight that. And I would like, uh, you know, I, I, I would please encourage you to take the opportunity to, uh, to read these articles. Uh, they have a tremendous insight. Uh, Yao, for instance, was talking about healthcare in Benin. Um, Frederick on about collaboration uh, in technology, um, and uh, Joao was talking about, um, uh, you know, development of medical in tech technology. So uh, please uh, take that opportunity, please, uh, to read those papers. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Joao Gomez to, to give us a little summary of what we have been discussing over the past year on robotics. Uh, we are due to publish uh, a DC paper on robotics by the end of this year, which will bring together everything that we have heard and all our own discussions as well. So, uh, Dr. Joao, can I give you the floor here, please? Uh, indeed, yeah. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Um, greetings to, to Kyoto. It's a pleasure to be here reaching out from, from Porto in Portugal, actually, where it's still morning time. And I'm honored to share with you um, the summary of this paper, which is titled uh, Robotics in Healthcare and um, Ethical and Technical Considerations. Um, so I'm going to do so on behalf of the Dynamic Coalition on Data-Driven Health Technologies, which is uh, guiding this session today. Um, just a broad overview uh, on this paper, it sheds um, an overview perspective into the integration of robotics in healthcare. It's a topic that we've been talking about today. Some of these points uh, that are mentioned in the paper were also discussed uh, already in here. Um, and the idea is to um, um, pro promise or to, to promote uh, these trends to, to revolutionize patient care while also presenting both the ethical and technical considerations of of doing so, which is also very relevant. Um, and it's precisely with this uh, dichotomous structure that the paper is uh, actually structured. So it seeks to be exhaustive in naming uh, each one of these challenges, but at the same time, it leaves a lot of space for discussion within uh, the challenge itself. Um, so that's precisely the same structure that I'm gonna follow. Uh, I'm going to start with the ethical considerations that are mentioned in the paper, uh, in the paper I mean, um, and that arise from the integration of uh, robotics in, in healthcare. So uh, imagine this world where uh, automatized systems are actually collecting the vast amounts of uh, sensitive patient data. It was mentioned with the example, for example, of the teddy bear uh, just now. Um, and we need to ensure that data privacy is one of the elements that comes first, uh, and it must be ensured with the utmost care. And that's precisely uh, where encryption and other security mechanisms are necessary to prevent these uh, patient data breaches that eventually harm patients. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to make sure that whatever data we are collecting, it is of good quality and interpretable. Um, the idea in the end is to inform healthcare decisions, so we need to be accurate in what we are collecting, um, and analysis of these data should also be paramount. Um, and this is also very much linked with the topic of uh, autonomy and accountability. So as robots um, become autonomous uh, in the decision-making capabilities, uh, we need to ask ourselves who should be held accountable in case of adverse events. Is it the developer? Is it the user? Um, so these are the questions that, that we also try to discuss in this paper. Um, and they are also linked with the fact that the technology should be safe and reliable. And uh, our suggestion on one side falls into the realms of transparent governance, um, which um, can be essential outlining, for example, the roles and the responsibilities of the stakeholders in the development and deployment of these technologies, but also at the lower level, ensuring that there's rigorous design, testing, um, and that there's an existence of emergency stop systems um, and regular maintenance of these systems so that they function as intended. Um, then there's the element of the human-machine interaction, which is inevitable. Um, how do we ensure that patients and providers are comfortable and knowledgeable enough about these interactions? Um, and what we discuss in the paper as well are uh, potentially setting up guidelines for human-robot interaction and education um, for the users and the providers as well. And lastly, on the type of et ethical considerations, we talk about um, fairness and equity. This is all fun and games, but if at the end of the day, no one is able to access uh, these technologies, including in, uh, in rural areas uh, with more limited healthcare access, for example, um, we, we need to make sure that the, the ground is set at an equal level for, uh, for all the players and all the users. Um, and then uh, we talked about the ethical considerations in this paper, uh, and then we jumped into the technical ones. Uh, we can start with the obvious, which is hardware and software integrations. So we need to make sure that we have a seamless integration of both hardware and software, um, which is critical for the operations of robots and these technologies. Um, in an idyllic setting, uh, we have these medical devices working in harmony uh, with intelligent algorithms. Uh, but for this to be a reality, we also need uh, accurate sensors and act actuator selection. This was part of the first intervention as well and mentioned there. Um, as well as an adapted power management, which may seem a very obvious, um, easy to meet requirement. But if we need to ensure a continuous power supply, we also need backup systems to avoid disruptions that could compromise the care uh, and healthcare itself. Um, also on the topic of accessibility, we need the same continuous need in the aspect of connectivity and infrastructure itself. So we need a secure and reliable connection, which is vital for the data exchange that we mentioned in our ethical considerations, but also for remote robot operation. We have seen the examples of surgeries being performed at a distance, um, but for that to happen, we need this infrastructure in place. Um, and when we look at production, we also need to guarantee the elements of scalability. 
uh, and a good user interface design, which makes it easier for um, the healthcare providers and the users at the end of the day to navigate and control these robots. Um, and this is not a possibility also without proper training on both sides. Um, there are many other elements and uh, for the sake of time, I'll keep them aside of my intervention, uh, but I'll briefly mention them like maintenance and support, regulatory compliance for them to become true medical devices, job displacement and creation, which is something I didn't talk about, but it would lead to another full, full discussion on this topic and economic impact. Um, in conclusion, uh, the, the integration of robotic stealth care, of course, it offers potential, um, a lot of potential, um, but it also demands a balance between these ethical and technical challenges. And that's what we seek to do with this paper. Um, it's still a live document. So we definitely invite you to, uh, to make your additions and your collaborations. Feel free to either forward them our way to make the interventions now, either verbally or in written form, and uh, we'll make sure to take them into account for the paper itself. So thank you for your attention and looking forward for further engaging discussions uh, on this matter. Thank you, Dr. Jarrow. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I think he, he summarized that well. So we have the key takeaway, I think, as well. Um, so just now, I think we have about 10 minutes left, and uh, I, I just want to ask whether a couple of our DC members would like to uh, make an intervention. What about Yao? Would you like to make an intervention? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amari, for giving the floor. I'm Josui Yao, I'm a I'm a student. I'm a researcher currently at uh, FH Uranium, the University of Applied Science, Austria class. Um, also member of DC. Um, I would like uh, yeah, I would like to thank all the DC members for this intervention and all our uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, my contribution here will be I would like to um, give uh, some reflection on the convention of the human computer uh, interface with robotics and its uh, transformative potential for creating green and healthy uh, healthcare envir environment and taking into consideration what have been already discussed uh, and also the profound impact of the uh, human computer interface with robotics and we see that can be uh, they can have also on our health system uh, as highlight in the conclusion of one of my paper the, which is a uh, design principle for healthcare e healthcare and medical uh, Things. And also a uh, second paper, which is future of healthcare which is sustainable. Uh, I would like to mention some uh, key uh, notes on this in, in regard to the recent development in the field, which is it implies. So the, the journey towards um, a green healthcare environment is not without challenge. We need to mention that. And it's uh, imperative to, for us to tackle this obstacle. And in recent development in the field will inevitably include uh, integration of AI into human uh, computer interface and robots, how they are revolutionizing healthcare system, but also take into account how AI-driven AI diagnostics and prediction analytics and personalized treatment can, uh, can be recommended and also can be enhanced. Uh, and also, I would say, are needed to enhance healthcare outcome while reducing uh, waste in the field. Not to forget that uh, telemedicine platforms are uh, also becoming increasingly uh, used, but we need uh, more user friendly uh, interfaces to provide accessible uh, features, accessibility features, of course, but also. Um, convey healthcare service so that the accessible features are usable and uh, implementable. And those human computer interfaces uh, play a pivotal role in ensuring that uh, platform developed for medical healthcare and mainly telemedicine are uh, intuitive, inclusive for all patients. And of course, innovation in medical robotics are not only uh, improving, improvising surgery precision, but also can help reduce energy consumption of medical procedures and lightweight uh, energy efficiency. Robotics system uh, 
are becoming the norm now, as you mentioned already, in modern healthcare settings. So a uh, key consideration for my hand uh, to, uh, to take into account when it comes to greening the healthcare environment, I think is to mention that we need to work on reducing carbon printing for healthcare facilities. Uh, and this could be done by prioritizing renewable energy sources such as solar and wind power, solar technology, but also the energy efficiency of data centers, which are as uh, you supporting human computer interfaces and robot applications are uh, a crucial aspect to, to take into account. And one of the aspect also, uh, Dr. Zhao has mentioned in the book we have with Travis Sister, uh, employing advanced cooling technologies and optimizing server farm there so that they can have significant, they can significantly help reduce energy consumption like temperature sensing and sophisticated control measure. And when it's come also to uh, yeah, designing oh. and Could I ask you to close, please? Yeah, yeah, I would like to conclude, which is when it comes to uh, designing and manufacturing these uh, interfaces and robot devices, we should prioritize sustainability, recycling materials, and contribute to uh, the waste so that at the, uh, to have a smaller ecological footprint on this thing. So this is uh, on a nutshell my uh, take take on this uh, discussion. Thank you very much for the floor. Thank you, Yao. I want to ask Frederick Cohen if he would like to share some thoughts. Hello, thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to meet you today. I would like to thank you for all uh, our work uh, together this year and for our past uh, work uh, the last year together. Uh, it was an important year uh, to work uh, together uh, this year because uh, we were uh, traveling uh, very much uh, in Asia the, and uh, we were meeting uh, each other uh, in Shanghai uh, for, the, uh, for the focus uh, meeting group with the ITU on uh, the metaverse and uh, further development uh, would be important also for uh, the internet because of development uh, uh, with uh, other partners uh, everywhere in the world uh, are very important for us. Uh, medical health system are also developing with uh, different uh, uh, accuracy and now it's important uh, to meet each other for other uh, development in uh, edge technologies uh, which is continuing uh, with uh, our different regions for uh, everywhere. I think uh, this uh, our focus uh, for uh, least development countries and other uh, island uh, uh, situation are important uh, to uh, reconnect, to uh, focus, uh, to a better uh, uh, communication uh, with uh, the communities everywhere in the world. Thank you very much. And I hope we could see you uh, so the, the next year. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Frederick. I just want to pass it over to Amado. Uh, so thank you very much from my side. Uh, we're running out of time. We can't take too many questions, but I'm going to pass it over to Amado right now. And thank you for uh, joining us today. Oh, thank you very much, Amali. I think it was a very interesting uh, discussion with all the panelists very uh, well selected in the topics. Uh, I only want to uh, close the, these uh, uh, presentations by inviting all the attendees to join the, our dynamic coalition. We are really um, concerned about this concept of robotics, which it is not only in the physical world, but um, software is also nowadays considered as a medical device in software is intervening in different aspects of the healthcare system by analyzing imaging, by uh, undergoing uh, symptoms ch checking processes or triaging uh, patients in different situations and so on. Then as Dr. Garcia said at the very beginning, the electronic medical records are one of the most important sources of data for the analysis of th all those uh, AI applications related to the medical, to the uh, healthcare system. 
and digital health of course is nowadays the new trend to to make the universal coverage a reality then i certainly invite all of you to to join us uh, in this uh, study at the uh, at this coalition uh, the governance of in the, the internet governance applied at the medical uh, care at the healthcare system it's a very very important topic which everybody is looking at and uh, well thank you very much for your participation here and thank you very much for all the speakers that uh, were involved in this discussion and we hope to meet uh, next year again at this uh, event Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for our last speaker. Thank you.